I haven't done this before, so all cameras are rolling and we'll see how we go. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> I hate it when he says that. <laughs> Well, looking at the wind prediction websites, today, Saturday, is the day we are probably going to get the least amount of wind. And so this is the day we're going to take the opportunity to bring out the mainsail, drop the mainsail, and then get into the furling mechanism and replace the furling line, which is frayed, just like we replaced the headsail furling line. Because we want to bring the mainsail down as fast as possible after we've brought it all the way out, because we are still at anchor here, we're going to prep the main halyard first so that's just ready to release and let go as quickly as possible. And here at the mast we've got all our halyards marked so we know which one we're going to release. That's our topping lift, that's this one, this is our main halyard and this is our jib halyard or Genoa halyard. As you can see these things don't get moved that often. <laughs> Once it's up it stays up hopefully. one of my scuba instructors used to say to me, prior preparation prevents piss poor performance. The five P's. We're still very lucky to have relatively low wind. And as you can see, we have brought the mainsail out. But the one thing we've got to do here at the mast is to take this access plate off so that when we drop the, the main sail uh, we can actually get it out of the groove. So now if we look inside here we can actually see how the bottom of the main sail is attached to the furling mechanism with this shackle. Alright so we're going to drop the sail so you will be flaking the sail. Okay. So with the sail now down and flaked across the boom and tied off at various lengths just to keep it all nice and neat and tidy. Now we've got to actually unhook the sail from the furling mechanism. And as you can see here, it's just held on with a U-belt, same as it is down at the bottom. So this is the top and the bottom one is down there. The trick is to undo this without losing anything inside the mast. It does make a lot of noise, but that's just the mechanism bouncing around inside the mast without the cushioning effect of the sail. <laughs> well done, Baz. Is that yeah, you on? just put the... Just the screw goes in a different side. Yeah, so now, now when it goes back on, mm. it'll screw in that way. I got more working space. Mm. So what do you have to do now? Tell us. This. So I've got to do the same thing with the U-belt at the bottom of the sail. Oh. And working in there is pretty tight, so we probably won't be able to get my hands, the pliers and, and the, the camera. camera in. So I'll get onto it. Okay. Having the sail flaked over the boom further reduced my access to the lower U-belt, so we decided to drop the sail onto the deck, which made life a heck of a lot easier. We did have a look online at a YouTube video for how to replace the furling line and even though they've got the, the screw inside the mast like we have that the furling line wraps around, theirs tied onto the, the screw totally different as in it went through the hole, dropped down the bottom, you pull the bottom out, put a stopper knot in, pull it back tight, Bob's your uncle. Ours looks like it's got a screw that goes through from one side to the other side of the screwing mechanism very noisy. If you unscrew the screw far enough, there's enough space to then pull the old line out, put the new line through, and then screw the screw in. So that's what we're trying to do at the moment, but we're trying not to lose the screw if we put out too far inside the mast. Yes. That would be disastrous. So I've made a slip knot <laughs> on the end of a piece of string, which I'm going to feed around the um, screw head. So looking 
inside the mechanism, it does just look like the screw penetrates through here and locks it into place. All right, well, what we're going to do is we're going to undo the screw. And okay, see what happens. all right. So, you need a big screwdriver then? Yeah. That one over there? The big flathead, yeah. I'm going to keep that on there. Yes, um, I'll, I'll pull it back tight. Jeez, that's how much just that little incy wincy bit there that the screw was into the line. So on our particular in mass furling mechanism, that's what happens. This screw, this line goes through a hole and this screw comes through a hole on a right angle and they intersect and that holds it inside. Um, so what we're going to do now is just take this back out the way it comes to here, replace it with the new line, put the new line through, put the screw back in, and then put everything back together and put the sail up and go swimming. <laughs> I like the swimming bit. I like the swimming bit too. <laughs> so I've got the new furling line through the hole on the opposite side of here and it comes out here and we've, um, we've burnt the end just to be sure to be sure. And so now we know that when the screw goes in, it's actually going to be biting right in the middle of the line that runs through the worm. Yeah. So um, quite happy about that in comparison to what we took out. Yeah. And there's the screw hole. Now all we've got to do is get the screw in and tightened up. By this point we've been out in the blazing Greek sun for about four hours and we weren't thinking correctly. We made our first rookie mistake in that we didn't wind enough furling line back onto the worm. Because as you can see, when the mainsail is fully furled away, there are only four turns around the worm. Whereas when the sail is unfurled, the furling line goes all the way up to almost the top of the worm. Here's our reaction when we attempt to furl the sail away and discover that we simply can't. The only way to fix the situation was to drop the mainsail, detach the sail from the top and the bottom of the furling mechanism. Once the sail was detached, we could then spin the furling mechanism by hand and fully wind up the furling line into the worm. It sounds simple when you say it like that, but that whole process took us another 45 minutes in the hot Greek sun. That's one noob mistake we definitely won't be making again. One morning in Milos, we walked around a Damas Harbour town. and walked over the hill to Lagarda Beach. And then made our way back to the port. Another day we took a bus to Trio Vassilos. After a wonderful lunch with the locals in Trio Vassilos. See, she knows this stuff. We I've got, have got another bus journey, which only took minutes really, to Plaka. Yeah. And it seems that regardless of the distance travelled on the bus, the cost is always the same. One euro eighty per person wherever you get off. So if you go from one end to the other, it's yeah. one euro eighty. Yeah. If you do every stop, it's one euro eighty. Yeah. It was the same the other place, wasn't it? Yeah. The other island. It's good. And the buses are great. Mm -hmm. All right, let's find out something about Plaka. Do you know the only French that I remember from school? Vous êtes ici. Oh, well done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you are here. I am here. We are here. And we're going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. Sand museum. Explore the multitude of colours and textures of sand from all over the world. Not to be missed. I think we've found which way to go. Follow the footwalk. <laughs> we 
we are footwalking in Placa. It might be a footwalk, but there are cars on it too. One thing we'd noticed as we came on the bus journey was that there are many people growing their own veggies in lots of places on the Greek islands. One of the things that Milos is most famous for is, of course, the statue of the Venus de Milos. And you'll find reproduction statues in a lot of the tourist shops. One lane in Placa led to a church with a breathtaking view of the entrance to Milos Bay. We stopped and had a refreshing drink at one of the little cafes in Placa. But we were still looking for the Sand Museum. I oh, just found Angie's house. I didn't know she owned a property in Milos. And I guess when I come to visit, this is where I'll be staying. This little corner of Placa is where all the cool cats hang out. Not, do not disturb sign. Hello, say something. Yeah. Is that, that's it, is it? Great, thanks. Our search through Placa eventually brought us to our goal. The Sand Museum. One of the best finds so far in Placa has been the Sand Museum. You wouldn't think that sand would be so interesting but what this guy does with sand and making art is just truly amazing. It's well worth the visit. Some of the stuff here is just a oh wow. And there are sand samples from all over the world, including Queensland, Australia, Africa, France, United Kingdom and Ireland. America, Oceania, Asia, Spain and Portugal, Italy, the Balkans, Northern Central Europe. And this is just scratching the surface. All of this is made with different types and colors of sand. Judy, this is for you. Look, oh, Lincolnshire and Liverpool. These are all sands from ancient sites. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. These hourglasses have a magnet in the base, and the sand in here is actually metal. So next time you go to the beach, take a magnet with you and do this. Or even better, come to Milos, to the Sand Museum, oh, look at and that. do it here. <laughs> That's amazing. And just like that, we're back at Adamus and ready to get back home. I'm going for a swim when I get back. Me too. just had a very interesting email from Australia. Oh yeah? Who from? From a lady called Courtney from Take 5 magazine. Take 5 magazine? What's yeah. that want? Well, um, she's found out about our story and she wants to feature it in the September monthly edition of Take 5. How oh, cool! <laughs> That's very cool! There's uh, a contract yeah. which she asks us to read, yeah. 
and if we're happy with the contract, then um, she'll give us a call to interview us. Sweet. When when's she doing that? Uh, she wants to do it in the shortest time frame possible. Um, if we're happy, then she'll call us in a couple of days. Excellent. Excellent, Smithers. <laughs>